Please turn with me to Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. I'm still trying to uh, locate a title for this message for uh, to put on the internet. So if you come up to the uh, uh, 30, how many characters? 30 characters. 30 characters, and it's better than Grant, then you'll win it. <laughs> There's a saying that a day is a long time in politics. That would be certainly true for yesterday, uh, for those who were hanging on the votes. But after reading Luke chapter 4, you could also conclude that a day was a long time in the life of Jesus. Jesus was no politician, but he lived with the same kind of, and I have to use this word because I couldn't think of another word, so if if it's a new one, vagaries, the vagaries of weather, the vagaries of the crowds that uh, politicians live with. He wasn't a politician, no, but he lived with the same kind of vagaries of the crowd that politicians live with. One minute you're praised, the next minute they, minute they want to get rid of you. You're in one minute, you're out the next. And Luke 4 certainly demonstrates how quickly the mood of the crowd can change. We're probably fortunate here that we don't have any uh, steep cliffs nearby uh, for preachers. From verse 14 we hear that that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. So there's the, uh, the response initial, very positive. All spoke well of him. Um... But then he comes to Nazareth, his own hometown and initially uh, the response to his message is uh, one of praise. Uh, They all spoke well of him, verse 22. They were amazed at the gracious words that he spoke. But by the end of the meeting the vote has changed There's no hung parliament. They want him out completely. And he's carried along by an angry mob to the the edge of the cliff where they intend to bring an end to his life and his ministry. We might actually think this is a bit hard to believe. Coming from a nice religious gathering to a place where they want to kill you. Well, you could talk to John Wesley who uh, preached in England and uh, where the crowd often wanted to stone him. But you could go to all kinds of situations and see people turn from apparent support to uh, great hostility in a moment. And some of us may even think of situations where that has occurred. But before we went, we look at what went wrong we need to see what Luke, uh, that Luke 4 is nothing like a political inaugural speech. It's, it's been called the inaugural uh, speech of the kingdom, but it's certainly not like a political inaugural speech that hasn't gone down too well with the electorate. It's no small announcement here. Some people think politics is the big thing, but this is bigger than that. This is the, the, it is the inaugural speech of Messiah. It is the announcement of the arrival of the kingdom of God. This is the promised rule of God breaking into fallen human history in the word and action of Jesus. This is what is being proclaimed. This is everything the human heart longs for and yet fights against with all its pride and ego. 
is the, the destruction of all that is evil and the restoration and renewal of this creation under the righteous and just rule of God through the man that he has sent, his beloved Messiah Son. It is the launching of the messianic age where swords are beaten into plowshares and there will be no more training for war, a day in which death will no longer hold humanity in bondage and where every man will sit under his gum tree and no one will make them afraid. When Jesus quotes from Isaiah 61 or when he reads that scroll from Isaiah 61, he is announcing the gospel of the kingdom, good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, release to the oppressed, the announcing of God's grace. This is the kingdom of God. There's no word in this passage that says, speaks of the king or the kingdom, but it certainly speaks of the good news being preached to the poor. And in uh, chapter 4 and verse 43, Jesus says, I must, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also. So clearly he sees the good news as being about the kingdom of God and uh, the passage in Isaiah 61 relates also to other passages, passages in Isaiah that speak clearly of the kingdom. Uh, for instance, Isaiah 52 and verse 7, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. This is the good news, that the kingdom of God has come upon us. The good news is the proclamation that there is a reign of holy love that has come into this world with all the power and grace of God to liberate those who have tried to unseat the true king of this creation. He comes to rebels to set them free from the shame of their guilt and the slavery of their sin through his own saving judgment. It is a word, this word in Isaiah 61, that initially spoke to Israel in exile in Babylon, needy and heartbroken because of sin, released, sorry, lost myself, imprisoned and oppressed because of the Lord's judgment. But this word to those who know their own poverty and in that poverty to their utter dependence on the mercy of God, to those who know that only God can set them free from the consequences of their sin, this word could only find its true fulfilment in the coming Messiah. It's a word that speaks to all of us and to the whole human condition. It is not just a word to Israel. It is a word to all who have abused the gifts of God. Isaiah 61 is about the huge thing that God said he would do in the last days. It is the arrival of the kingdom of God in the midst of this broken, fallen, rebel world. And it is no small thing. It is the reversal, reversal of all that has gone wrong in the world. It is the outpouring of God's grace and favour on those who have no claim on it. Jesus is making a stunning claim. When he reads that passage and he rolls up the scroll because the scriptures were written on the scrolls, he gives it back to the attendant. He sits down because a rabbi, a teacher would sit to teach in the synagogue and all the eyes of everyone are fixed on him. They've heard of his ministry elsewhere. Now he's come home. We want to see his stuff. And he says to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. If we could really enter into the expectation of Israel 
to hear that word was a stunning thing. He's saying that his ministry of healing and setting people free, more than that, he's actually saying that just the proclamation of that word is the fulfilment of the promised kingdom of God. There are many Old Testament prophecies that speak of the outpouring of the Spirit and link it with the coming kingdom. And now he says he is the one on whom the Spirit has come, he has been anointed by the Spirit to proclaim this good news and then to demonstrate its presence by setting people free and binding up their broken hearts. And so it all flows from the Spirit. This is the dawning of the new age, the promised age of peace and justice, the fulfilment of the Davidic kingdom with the promise of universal blessing. The year of the Lord's favour. It's reminiscent of the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, the law declared that uh, debts would be forgiven, slaves would be set free, land would be restored to the original owners. And now this prophecy takes up the thought that a wonderful redemption, the year of the Lord's favour, just like the year of Jubilee, would come in history when God in sovereign grace redeems us from the consequences of our sin slavery and death and so it's the dawning of a new age we know that the return of Israel for exile never lived up to the prophetic expectation so they waited some waited 400 years in the hope that God would finally fulfil his promise and now this young preacher comes home to the place where he grew up and on the Sabbath he attends the synagogue that was his habit And he's given the opportunity to teach because he was a visiting rabbi with a reputation and he declares that this word is now fulfilled in their hearing. One thing's clear, the kingdom of God is not up for re-election. There's no question of a hung parliament when it comes to God's kingly rule. It's not about voting the kingdom of God into power or even launching a people movement to sweep our Messiah into the highest place of power. You know, by the time of Jesus' birth, this uh, hope of a coming kingdom had been turned largely into a political kingdom a political hope. They had politicised the idea of Messiah. That's why Jesus preferred to use the title Son of Man rather than Messiah or Son of David. It's only after the cross that the term Christ or Messiah is freely used of Jesus because the cross makes it impossible to interpret Jesus along nationalistic or political lines. Jesus told Pilate my kingdom is not of this world he didn't mean to relegate the reality of the kingdom into some sort of distant heavenly place although that is certainly true but what he meant was that his kingdom was not a political power not a worldly kingdom it was the kingdom of God Pilate was wondering whether Jesus was a political threat are you Are you the king of the Jews? He was no political threat to Pilate in that sense but he was a threat to all the kingdoms of this world. He was willing to accept son of David from blind Bartimaeus. Remember he cried out son of David have mercy on me. Bartimaeus blind though blind could see But when the crowds wanted to make him king he wouldn't let them because he knew what was in man. He knew knew what was in their hearts. He knew they were happy to have a political kingdom that left them utterly in power 
with God of course. Jesus knew that the kingdom of God could never be brought into power on the wave of political support. He was not leading a kingdom of God party hoping for the votes of the people. That would just be a caricature of the kingdom of God. It would be another kingdom of this world. He didn't stop thinking of himself as king. He didn't discourage people from seeking the reign of God, seeking the kingdom. He just knew that it would take a crisis, a world crisis, a world taken to judgment on a cross before we would be ready to gladly receive the kingdom. It was only when he rode on the donkey into Jerusalem that he let the crowds acclaim him as king. He didn't come on a war horse in order to seize power. He came knowing that he was its king and he asserted that claim by going in to cleanse the temple from all the, the worldly trading going on. And uh, the priests certainly understood his meaning. By what authority do you do this? They knew he was confronting them with a question that demanded an answer. Would they acknowledge him as king or would they destroy him? There was no alternative. So they crucified him and that very act was the way God established his rule in the lives of a new people of God. So Jesus transformed that messianic hope that had become politicised he transformed it by fulfilling it and the way he fulfilled it did not, did not look like the kingdom of God that they had expected even John the Baptist had doubts he sent his disciples to Jesus and said are you the one or should we hope for someone else remember Jesus didn't quote from the Isaiah passage was the second bit of verse 2 he talks about the day of the Lord's favour but he doesn't talk about the day of vengeance of our God the listeners would have been happy to hear about God's judgement on the pagans but Jesus was saying that the kingdom of God coming in his ministry was the initial fulfilment of what God had promised but the consummation the judgement of God on all evil would come at the end that would be the day of the vengeance of our God and so one theologian has put it this way the kingdom of God involves two great moments fulfilment this is not just dry theology I don't think we get this and that's why we don't get most of the parables there are two great moments within history. There is the fulfilment within history in the ministry of Christ breaking into this world, the rule of God. And then at the end of history there is the consummation. You see, they didn't understand how the kingdom of God had come in the ministry of Christ. He hadn't come as the great warrior Messiah to destroy their enemies and rule the world from Jerusalem. He spoke of the mystery or the secret of the kingdom but to a Jew the whole idea of the kingdom was not meant to be a mystery. It was meant to be as clear as mud. It was meant to be so obvious but it wasn't obvious. Even John the Baptist had doubts. And so in his parables he taught the secret of the kingdom, that the kingdom of God had come in advance of the, before the final revelation and manifestation of the kingdom of God. It's already arrived in the person of Christ but in a hidden and secret way and men and women are being delivered from the power of evil and brought into the blessing of this kingdom right before your eyes. The blessing of the age to come is coming upon us now. And so we enter the kingdom of God now, we receive the kingdom now, the light is shining in the darkness now. But because it's come in a, in a hidden way, it's like yeast silently working in the dough.
when the church wants to drum up support for the kingdom of God or lift its profile in the eyes of the world, then we'll resort to all kinds of worldly power and political image and spin. We don't end up with the kingdom of God, but a worldly kingdom with religious slogan. Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God that has come in his life and ministry can appear weak and it can be rejected. It can appear to be frail and and to fail like seed that has fallen on a path to be eaten by the birds or like seed on rocky ground where the young seedlings get roasted by the sun or amongst thorns which choke the word of the kingdom and make it unproductive. The word of the kingdom can appear at times to be unable to compete with the worries of this world, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things. It can be appear to be a weak word. But then on some soil, that word of the kingdom produces a rich harvest. And it does. Some years ago, I read a book called Reign of Terror, Reign of Love. It's It's about the story of Idi Amin and the way the gospel bore great fruit during that terrible time of of violence and death. And there was a politician uh, called Kawanaka, Joseph Kawanaka. He was uh, was an atheist. He was a proud man. He was a humanist. He considered religion to be a uh, political tool by which the powerful suppress the helpless. Uh, Once at the close of a match of his soccer team that he supported in a Catholic school, uh, he, he went up to the priest from the opposing team and slapped him across the face. And when he was asked by the reporters why he'd struck the man, he said, there is no God and walked away. Well then Idi Amin was swept to power and there was horrific um, murder and uh, assassination and Joseph Kwanaka came up to a church, to a pastor and he came to the service and he spoke to the pastor and he said, how do you see it? Do you think God knows what's going on? Do you think he's going to help us? And the pastor thought, this is not Joseph Kuanaka. This man is desperate and defeated. But he was careful how he answered because he knew how violent this man was. And uh, he said, if so, if he so wishes, he'll do something. And Kuanaka was silent and walked away. And then... uh, He came again a few weeks later to church and again he said, how do you see things? Is there a God? Does he know what's going on? And the pastor said, God is there. And forgetting his fears and suspicions, he said, have you considered that we ought to give ourselves entirely over to him? I have considered it. What is to be done? And uh, he went with the pastor and they knelt and prayed. And uh, when they'd finished, Kuanaka was weeping. And after he finished weeping, he was silent and then he turned to the pastor and he said, so there really is a kingdom. And the pastor was perplexed, he didn't understand what had happened. And uh, two weeks later, he, Joseph Kuanaka came to the church and before the whole congregation, he said this, From the beginning, I've been looking for a kingdom. I've been looking for a kingdom of freedom. I believed in the goodness of man and I believed that men and women could learn to love each other. Now I tell you, there is no good man. If God will leave us in our natural state, we will eat grass as the goats. But God has not left us. He has made for us the kingdom that we cannot make for ourselves. He has rescued us from our corruption and cruelty. The chains of our evil have been broken. It is I, 
Joseph Kawanaka, who am speaking, and I know what I'm saying. I have met the man of freedom, Jesus Christ. My sins have been forgiven. I stand before you as a new member of God's kingdom. There really is a kingdom. In the midst of that defeat, that violence, that horror, in fact, Kawanaka, who later became an elder in that church, eventually lost his life for the gospel in Uganda. But he knew that there really is a kingdom. A reign of love in the midst of a reign of terror. He saw God opened his eyes to see the kingdom of God. Those who heard Jesus in the synagogue, they could see and hear an impressive young preacher, but they could not see the kingdom of God. They couldn't see, they would not see. It's not just they could not. They would not. I met a woman this week, uh, she had a book on a shelf, Conversations with God, so I, I said, oh, did you enjoy the book? And she took it off the shelf and she said, you can have it. I've worked that one out. There is no God. And I said, how did you work that out? And she went on to say that God can't be God because someone else had to make him. And she was so full of certainty. (laughs) She'd worked it out. You see, she couldn't see God. She couldn't see the kingdom of God not because she just could not but because she would not. And she came up with a very illogical, simple explanation that quickly and easily put God out of the picture of her life and this world. They would not see the kingdom because their hearts were all wrong. Things are going well. They love the message, but it all turns bad. Jesus uh, speaks so graciously until he starts telling some little stories from the Old Testament. So let's try to see what's going on in these last few minutes. Um, They spoke well of him, but then someone said, Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this Joseph's son? And suddenly the mood changes. They become sceptical. He was a carpenter. If you look at Mark chapter 6, you discover that they say, look, we know his mother, we know his brothers, we know his sisters. He was a carpenter here. Some of them probably said, well, he, he fixed up my old door. He did a good job, but that doesn't make him a messiah. And so they become sceptical. And uh, it says in Mark 6 that Jesus could only do a few miracles in Nazareth. And it says that he was amazed at their lack of faith. Elsewhere there was faith coming. And it was God given because we can't work it up ourselves. But here was the one coming and healing and releasing people from evil and the response was there these were the covenant people of God but here in his own hometown their hearts are so hard and resistant they cannot believe that he could do a miracle amongst them familiarity breeds contempt they knew him too well he was their hometown boy Prove to us that you're as good as people say you are. Show us your power to heal and we'll believe. They were wanting evidence before they would believe that he was the one fulfilling Isaiah 61. And that indifference, that unbelief, quickly turns into blind hate and open hostility because Jesus exposes what's in their heart. And so in a matter of seconds, the atmosphere has changed from warm support 
to hatred. If he'd been a clever politician, he might have been able to wing it and uh, turn the, the crowd around. But he wasn't trying to buy their support by promising the world. He didn't use political spin to win them over. He doesn't try to reassure them, those who've got doubts about his qualifications. He will not heal the people of his wound lightly. He will not say peace, peace when there is no peace. He won't put a little band-aid over this weeping sore of unbelief. He goes out to lance the infection. He speaks in such a way as to draw out what's in their heart. He says, surely you'll say to me, Doctor, heal yourself. You know, fix up your own hometown if you're so good at making people well. Do hear <coughs> what you've done elsewhere. He tells them a prophet is not accepted by his own hometown. He's saying more than it's difficult for someone to achieve greatness by those who know him most. He's saying how easy it is to write off the word of God because it comes to you through someone you know so well. And so Jesus goes in for the kill. He shares two little stories about Elijah being sent to a widow in the region of Sidon. She was not a Jew. A widow was of no value in Jewish society, but a Gentile widow, you've got to be kidding tells a story about Elisha being sent to a leper. A leper was an unclean, ceremonially unclean. You wouldn't go near him. But this one was not just a leper. He was a Syrian. What is he saying? He's saying that Israel is so hard-hearted and lacking true faith that the prophets of God Elijah and Elisha are sent to Gentiles a Gentile widow and a Gentile leper even though there are many widows and lepers in Israel God does not send his prophet to them because they will be rejected they saw themselves as God's favourite people because they'd kept the law they despised pagans <coughs> To speak of the Gentiles getting better treatment from God than the Jews was not just an insult, it was treachery. He was a traitor. And what do you do to traitors? You do away with them. He was a threat to the status quo. He was a threat to security. I heard a TV commentator make this revealing comment about a well-known footballer who's come out with his drug issues. And this commentator said, when you kill the AFL image, the AFL kills you. So Jesus was attacking the image of Israel. I suppose uh, another equivalent would be, you touch my car, I break your face. Fallen human nature is very sensitive about any criticism of its self-made image, whatever. Thanks, Grant. That whatever that utterly deficient image is, our shabby little justifications are nothing compared to the glory of God's great act of justification. To take pride in being a Jew or anything else, instead of magnifying the grace of God, is an empty boast. But worse than that, to think that any of us can bring in the kingdom by our own goodness is the worst horror of all. I won't tell this story, but some of you will know the story of the golden egg of love in Geoffrey Bingham's book, Strong as the Sun. That is a very powerful story about someone who felt they had the calling to bring love to the world and they were willing to kill to do so. 
So why does Jesus claim meet such hostility in his own hometown? They had a wait and see attitude but in the end it was exposed as a self-confidence in who they were and in what they had done. They had no expectation that God would come in great mercy and grace to restore them, those who had forsaken him, to the great calling to be the people of his kingdom. Their confidence was not in who God is as the king, nor in what God can do in his great kingdom. Their confidence was in who they were and what they were about. And they felt they compared very well with the other party. And when Jesus lifted up others, not as having status, but as having, but as being qualified to receive the grace of God, Gentile pagans who deserved God's wrath, they were infuriated. And that's what gripped their hearts with murder and hatred and violence, wanting to destroy this upstart of a young preacher who touched their car. They were trusting in their own little kingdom and not in the gift of God's reign of blessing. We may, we may at times be just as familiar with the things of God like they were familiar with Jesus. He'd grown up in our town. We may be familiar with the things of God in such a way that we fail to see how big, how huge this kingdom is and how it totally unseats us, in fact takes us and puts us to death on a cross with him because there's nothing of ourselves that we can bring into this kingdom. We must be made new. We must be put to death and raised up new in Christ. Why does he rub salt in to the wound? Why does Jesus make things worse by telling those pointed stories? Torrance writes these beautiful words. We must turn back again to the fact that the covenant partnership of God with Israel had the effect of intensifying the conflict of Israel with God. So long as the cords of the covenant were not drawn tight and God remained, so to speak, at a distance, the conflict was not very sharp. But the closer God drew near the more, the closer God drew near, the more the human self-will of Israel asserted itself in resistance to its divine vocation. Thus the more fully God gave himself to this people, the more he forced it to be what it actually was, what we all are in the self-willed isolation of fallen humanity from God. Thus the movement of God's reconciling love toward Israel not only revealed Israel's sin, but intensified it. That intensification, however, is not to be regarded simply as an accidental result of the covenant, but rather as something which God deliberately took into the full design of his reconciling activity, for it was the will and the way of God's grace to effect reconciliation with man at his very worst, precisely in his state of rebellion against God. That is to say, in his marvellous wisdom and love, God worked out in Israel a way of reconciliation which does not depend on the worth of men and women but makes their very sin in rebellion against him the means by which he binds them forever to himself and through which he reconstitutes their relations with him in such a way that their true end 
is fully and perfectly realised in unsullied communion with himself in a kingdom without end. It takes the cross for God to bring all our cruel rejection of the good news to its horrible conclusion and then raise us up as a kingdom spirit anointed people wonderfully humbled totally forgiven and utterly devoted to the service and action of the king that's where God has brought us or maybe for some is bringing you the gospel of the kingdom